In this section, we'll move the HTML generation library to its own module. Each Haskell source file is a module. The module name should have the same name as the source file and should start with a capital letter. Subdirectories should also be part of the name and we use the dot to denote a subdirectory. We'll see that in the next section. The only exception to the rule are entry points to the program. Modules with the name main that define main function in them. Their source file names could have any name they want. A module declaration looks like this. A module, module name, export list, and away keyword. The export list can be omitted if you want to export everything defined in the module, but we don't. We will list exactly the function and types we want to export. This will give us control on how people can use our tiny library. I created a new source file name HTMLHS and added the following module declaration code to the top of the file. Note that we do not export the constructors for our new types, only the types themselves. If you want to export the constructors as well, we would have written the HTML like this or like this. This way the user cannot create their own structure by writing invalid structures. And we didn't export external functions used by the library, such as element. So let's move all the HTML related functions from the hello HS file to this new HTML HS file. Now anyone importing our module will only be able to import what we export. For example, we can adapt our hello HS file. We use import statement below module declaration but above any other declaration. So now our hello HS file imports our HTML module, has a main file and one specific example, while HTML module contains all the HTML related stuff. And as an aside, you might have noticed that we've decided to suffix the functions used to construct HTML values with an underscore. We've talked about it briefly before. This mostly an aesthetic decision, which is, in author's opinion, makes the EDSL easier to recognize. But it's also useful to avoid name clashes with functions defined in Haskell standard library or other libraries such as hat. And this idea comes from the Haskell HTML library named Lucid. Now that HTML has its own source file and module, and creating HTML code can be done only via the functions we have exported, we can also handle user input that may contain characters that may conflict with our meta language, HTML, such as symbols for creating HTML tags. We can convert these characters into different strings that HTML can handle. So let's look at a function called escape. In escape, we see a few new things. First, let expression. We can define a local name using this syntax. Let name some expression in some other expression. This will make the name, in this case, escape character, available as a variable in the second expression. We also see a pattern matching with multiple patterns. We match on different characters and convert them into a new string. Note that underscore is a catch-all pattern that will always succeed. So first the pattern match will try to match one of these and then it will fall back at the end. And we also use two new functions, map and concat. We'll talk about this more in depth soon. Linked lists are very common data structure in Haskell, so common that they have their own special syntax. The list types are denoted with brackets and inside them is the type of the element. For example, list of integers, list of characters, list of strings, a list of list of strings, as well as a list of any single type where all elements must be of the same type. This is how we create an empty list. Prepending an element to a list is done with the operator cons, which is right associative, like an arrow. We can create a list that has element 1, or 2, and 3. There is a special syntax for this. This list can actually be written like this, or if it's only one, strings are linked list of characters, so we can use them the same way we use lists. But do note, however, that linked lists, despite their convenience, are often not the right tool for the job. They are not particularly space efficient and are slow for appending, random access, and more. That also makes string a lot less efficient than what it could be. And in general, author and most of the Haskell community recommends using a different string type, which is text instead, which is available in an external package. We'll talk about lists text and other data structures in the future. We can implement our own operations on list by using pattern matching and recursion. And we'll touch on this subject later. For now, we'll use the various function found in the data list module, specifically map and concat. Using map, we can apply a function to each of the elements in the list. For example, if we apply a function not to the list of booleans, which is false true false, we're gonna get true false true. Or, as we can see it in our escape function, this can help us escape each character. So for example, something like this, less than and greater than are gonna be escaped, and h and 1 are gonna be unchanged. 
However, note that escape character has a type character to a string, so the result type of this expression is a list of strings. And what we really want is a string, not a list of strings. This is where concat enters the picture to help us flatten the list. Concat function has this type signature. It flattens a list of lists of something into a list of something. In our case, it will flatten a list of strings into the string. Remember that string is a type alias for list of characters, so we actually have list of list of characters to list of characters. I've been awkwardly showing expressions in the code in comments, but one way we can quickly see our code in action is using the interactive development environment, GHCI. Running GHCI will open an interactive prompt where Haskell expressions can be written and evaluated. This is called a read evaluate print loop for short a REPL. So for example, one plus one is two and prison hello world is hello world. We can also define new names such as double and running double with two gives us four. Moreover, we can write multi-line code as well. Let's paste and test the escape function. Note that we have to wrap the multi-line string in order to paste it. Okay, let's try escaping the HTML tag. Both of the special symbols were escaped. Importing code like this can be annoying. We can import Haskell source files using the load command, or L for short, and use our escape function directly. On top of that, we can import library modules. For example, we can import data.bits and use a couple of functions manipulating bits. We can even ask the type of the expression using the type command, or T for short. To wrap it up and exit GHCI, we can use quit command or Q for short. GHCI is a very useful tool for quick experiments and exploration. If you're having a hard time figuring out what a particular function does, consider testing it in the GHCI. Pass it different inputs and see if it matches your expectations. Concrete examples of running code can aid a lot in understanding it. If you'd like to learn more about GHCI, you can find a more thorough introduction in the GHC user guide. Currently, the user of our library can supply strings in a few places, in a page title, in paragraphs, and headings. We can apply our escape functions at these places before doing anything else with it. That way, all HTML constructions is safe. So we should try adding the escape functions in those places. First, in the HTML function, we have to escape the title. And then we have to escape the strings in both the header and the paragraph. So let's try to construct an invalid HTML and see if it's gonna work or not. Both the title and the body are escaped. We have now built a very small but convenient and safe way to write HTML code in Haskell. This is something that we could potentially publish as a library and share with the world by uploading it to a package repository such as Hackage. Users who are interested in our library could use the package manager to include our library in their project and build their own HTML pages with it. It's important to note that users are building their projects against the APIs that we expose to them, and the package manager does not generally provide access to the source code so they can't, for example, modify their HTML module that we expose in their project directly without jumping through some hoops. Because we wanted our HTML EDSL to be safe, we hid the internal implementation from the user, and the only way to interact with our library is via the clean and safe APIs that we provide. This provides the safety we wanted, but in this case it also blocks the user from extending our library in their own project with things that we have not implemented yet, such as lists or code blocks. When a user runs into trouble with a library such as a missing feature, the best course of action usually is to open an issue in the repository repository or submit a pull request, but sometimes the user needs things to work right now. We admit that we're not perfect and can't think of all the use cases for our library. Sometimes the restrictions we add are too great and may limit the usage of advanced users that know how things work under the hood and need certain functionality in order to use our library. For that, we can expose internal modules to provide some flexibility for advanced users. Internal modules are not a language concept, but rather a fairly common design pattern or an idiom in Haskell. Internal modules modules are simply modules named something.internal, which export all of the functionality and implementation details in that module. Instead of writing the implementation in, for example, the HTML module, we write it in the HTML.internal module, which will export everything. Then we will import that module in the HTML module and write an explicit export list to only expose the API we'd like to export, as we did before. Internal modules are considered unstable and risky to use by convention. If you end up using one yourself when using an external Haskell library, make sure to open a ticket in the library's repository after the storm has passed. So let's make the changes. We will create a new directory named HTML and inside it a new file named internal.hs. 
the name of this module should be html.internal. This module will contain all of the code we previously had in the HTML module, but we will omit the export list. And now in HTMLHS, we don't have the code that we move to the HTML internal and instead import the internal module. Now the users of our library can still import HTML and safely use our library, but if they run into trouble and have a dire need to implement an order lists to work with our library, they could always work with HTML internal instead. For our particular project, internal modules are not necessary because our project and the source code of the HTML EDSL are part of the same project and we have access to the HTML module directly. We can always go and edit it if we want and we're going to do that throughout the book. However, if we are planning to release our HTML EDSL as a library, for other developers to use, it would be nice to also expose the internal implementation as an internal module, just so we can save some trouble for potential users. We will see how to create a package from our source code in later chapter. Let's do some exercises. We need a few more features for our HTML library to be useful for our blog software. We have to add the following features to our HTML internal module and expose them from HTML. First one, unordered lists. We want in our library a new function, unordered list, that takes a list of structures and returns a structure so that our users can write an order list from different items so that our users can write an order list that consists of multiple items. First thing we have to do is to bring back the get structure string. We had it before, but it lasted somewhere, so we just need to bring it back so we can get the string out of the structure. So we get the list of structures. We have to get the strings out of the structures and put them in the element list item. We use the map function for this. Then we need to concatenate this into one string and create an element of an ordered list and wrap it in the structure in the end. Second, we want order lists. Very similar to an order list, but instead of ul tag, we use ol tag. Order list function is a couple of copy pastes away from the unordered list function. The list items stay unchanged on the parent tag changes. This is just asking for refactoring, but we're not gonna do this. And last but not least, we want code blocks. Very similar to paragraph, but use the pre tag and call this function code and re export these functions. We can give it a quick test. Let's create an unordered list with only one element, which is a code block. Note that we have to make sure to get the string out of the structure in order to see it. And we get back an ordered list with one element and a code block inside. In these chapters, we built a very minimal HTML EDSL. We will later use this library to convert our custom markup formatted text to HTML. We will also learn about defining and using functions, types and type signatures, embedded domain specific languages, chaining functions using the dot operator, preventing incorrect use with new types, defining modules and the internal modules pattern, and encapsulation using new types and modules. In the next part, we'll define a simple markup language and parse documents written in this language into Haskell data structures.